Hi, welcome to the Penis Project podcast. This is the place to come to find out everything you've always wanted to know about men's health but were too embarrassed to ask. Join physiotherapist Dr. Joe Milios and sexologist nurse practitioner Melissa Hadley Barrett as they talk to real men and the experts about men's private parts. Have a burning question you really want to know the answer to? Please subscribe to our website at thepenisproject.org and ask us. The greater the strength, the more time I've got for you. There's too much talking, texting, tweeting, posting. Too much noise altogether. In silence is strength and peace and space. Imagine silence forever. The Penis Project podcast is sponsored by Prost, Exercise for Prostate Cancer, Incorporated, a not-for-profit charity established in Western Australia in 2012 by myself, Joe Milios. I was really concerned that men diagnosed with prostate cancer weren't really getting the support and mateship that they probably needed, particularly when they were confronted with things like incontinence, erectile dysfunction, and of course the C word, cancer. So I literally had the opportunity to set up an exercise program. Um, it was meant to be the outcome or the, uh, the goal of my um, PhD studies, but in the end, uh, I found out it was going to take seven seven years to produce some results. So I decided to set up a little exercise program um, before I even started uh, the research. So PROST means to your health. And I learned about the word PROST on my Kentucky tour in uh, 2000. No, what am I saying? In 1989 when I was just 18 years of age. So PROST means to your health. And we're delighted that the PROST exercise program in Western Australia is about to go global um, by having it available online in the month of November. So big thanks to the board and chair of the PROST program for allowing us to have PROST as the Penis Project podcast sponsor. PROST! So today we have Parry with us. Parry is a gentleman who has been in quite a lot of difficult situations and has PTSD and we're going to talk to him about his journey and how he's dealt with this and things he's found that have been really helpful and things that haven't been so helpful and what it feels like to have PTSD. So Parry, tell us your story. When did all of this start for you? Um, I don't know when it started. Probably the the catalyst for it in hindsight was my deployment to Rwanda in 94 and 95. Mm-hmm. Um, PTSD was mentioned, so it was a term that I wasn't ignorant of. I'd seen articles on PTSD from particularly the Vietnam era and a lot of discussion about that. And we had a number of younger fellas that had significant mental health issues quite soon after return to Australia from the deployment. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't think that was a concern for me. I was sort of more mature than most. My life experiences were significantly greater than most. So how old were you when you went to Rwanda? Uh, It was in 94, so I was 34. Right, okay. Um, But we had lads there from 18 years of age. Yeah, God, so young. Uh, Yeah, very young. Um, And when you consider the mischief that went on in Rwanda, um, there was a hell of a lot for them to take in. Mm-hmm. Um, most of these lads pre-deployment had never seen bodies. They certainly hadn't seen hundreds of bodies decomposing. Mm. They hadn't seen um, mass graves where people had just been pushed into. Mm. Um, they hadn't seen mischief going on where opposing armies, as such, for want of a better word, would take their mischief out upon each other and mm. upon the civilian population. Mm-hmm. But, um, and you were there as a peacekeeping operation, weren't you, supposedly? Yes, we went in under um, Chapter 6 of the United Nations Charter, mm-hmm. which meant that we were supposed to be there in a peacekeeping role rather than a peacemaking role. Yeah. There are a lot of implications of Chapter 6, and that is you really can't do anything. Mm-hmm. If one of your people or people that you're responsible for are attacked, you can defend them. Yeah. But for the rest of the population, you can't do anything. Yeah. You know, this Chapter 6 argument 
was maintained for the for the whole time. Um, the previous um, force commander for the United Nations over there before the genocide had tried to get it changed away from Chapter 6 so they could do raids and collect all of the, the weapons that they knew were stockpiled because mm -hmm. this could be seen coming to the wise people. Yeah, okay. So it must have been very frustrating as well, not only seeing these atrocities but also being restricted in what you could do to help. Oh, totally restricted. Yeah. And your hands were tied. Um, mm -hmm. It made life very, very challenging mm -hmm. when, in fact, Australia's initial deployment to Rwanda was for the force to supply a medical support force to the United Nations troops who were working right. there. Yeah. So we had an incredibly capable surgical hospital team. Um, we were rotating specialists through from Australia. So they were over a third of our contingent. Wow. Yeah. We had an infantry rifle company which provided all of the protection. That was the team I was working with. Mm -hmm. And we had a, a, a logistics team that would provide transport, catering, administration, and all the headquarter elements. Right. So we yep. were quite organised. Mm -hmm. But most contingents that went to Rwanda took their own medical staff. Right. So they would deal with all of the normal, you know, scabs, colds, etc. at the local level. And they even though there were a total of, I think, 22 people killed over uh, United Nations soldiers over both Rwanda, uh, Rwanda missions, there was very little call for um, surgical intervention for the United Nations force. So they sidetracked onto humanitarian stuff. Right, and yeah. And were kept extremely busy. And that was what was so traumatic for you and everyone else involved, I suppose, um, seeing that. No, th there was there was mischief on the streets everywhere. Right. You didn't have to go to the hospital to see people with um, significant injuries mm -hmm. and old injuries. Now you'd see people come to some of the clinics that the medical team set up, and they would have bullet wounds through them that were weeks and weeks old. Right. Uh -huh. Yeah. And you know they're, they're fairly robust sort of people, as mm -hmm. well as you know the normal amounts of disease and health issues that a lot of people wouldn't have encountered before. So when you were there, did you feel like your mental health was changing then or was it really when you got home that it hit you? Well, no, I, I thought we had no issues with mental health. Okay. You know, there was just a lot of ugly stuff going on. Yeah, and so when did the mental health issues start coming out? They probably started... I probably brought those home with me. Yeah. But the issue is it was not being aware of it. Mm -hmm. You know, there's changes that go on and you try to sort of fold them off. Um... What, what sort of changes were you...? The biggest early symptoms that I had were not being able to sleep. Um, you get into bed and your mind would keep racing. And it could be something absolutely trivial would get on your mind, yeah. but you just can't clear the head. Mm -hmm. um, at times, there'd just be white noise in the head. So your head's just buzzing. There's no focus to it, no direction. But just constant, like, yeah, agitation? Yeah, you're, yeah. Just, you're just lying there, sort of... Waiting, almost. Yeah, 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 staring. Yeah. Uh, in line with this, hyper-alertness would be a, a constant problem, mm -hmm. where they would, you'd be lying in bed, sometimes you'd be fine, and then the eyes would just shoot wide open and you're listening for everything that's going on. Yeah. Um, th these aren't every night things, mm -hmm. but they will As the, the months turned into years... After coming back, they were there enough that I'd sort of, you know, I didn't speak much to my wife about them, but nightmares she'd be aware of, um, sort of shouting in my sleep, fighting in my sleep, or running while I'm asleep in bed. Yeah. Um, it must have been quite frightening for her too, because you would have changed a lot, I imagine, in your personality. Yeah, the, um, the bed stuff was actually the catalyst um, for me seeking help years and years later. Um, so not until 2008, is that right? Yeah, 2008 was when I spoke about it, when I actually did something about it, was um, 2009. So in 2008 we had an incident at home where I had a, had a nightmare and I'm sort of fighting and shouting and actually struck the wife on the back. Right, And yep. kicked her a couple of times in the process. And all in your sleep. Yeah. All in and your sleep. Yeah. She's woken up saying, oh, you're shouting and you've hit me. And oh. So that just frightened the hell out of me. Yeah, yeah. yeah. 
So that was the stage of we need to do something. Mm-hmm. But beforehand, I just sort of tolerated all this stuff. You know, the, the emotional side of it that goes with it is that I'd be really short-fused. Um, someone would have to say something and I'd bloody go off about it. Um, quite often the way I went off about things weren't in proportion to what my reactions or what the reactions of a reasonable person Yeah, so a more trivial thing be. became like an explosion yeah. from you. And did you feel like after you'd done that, did you think, geez, I overreacted or were you unaware of the fact even in retrospect? Oh, in hindsight, you know, that that, that wasn't good. Yeah. Um, you know, it was just... You just get sort of blown away with things and sometimes there was no reason for it. You know, mm-hmm. there was no obvious trigger or catalyst or cause. Yeah. You know, so... Just well, bubbling away. Yeah, 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 yeah. And later on, when I was speaking to a psychologist much later, she was saying that it's not uncommon for your emotional glass to be sitting near the top. So normally it would take quite a lot mm. of agitation to yeah. fill your glass. Yeah. But people with PTSD and these types of anxiety, the glass is sitting right near the top. On the so, brim, yeah. So all it takes is a few little drops thrown into it and, and it's overflowing. spilling over the yeah. side. Yeah, yeah. So, so that was there. The other things that sort of it took a long time to sort of get through to speaking to my wife about was the fact that I didn't need a reason to be cranky. Yeah. I could wake up cranky. Mm. I could be having a great day and suddenly I was cranky. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that becomes very, very confusing as well. Did it cause problems between your relationship or was she just accepting or was it...? Oh, no, it caused a lot of problems. Mm. But she took... A lot of it on the chin, mm-hmm. um, and I wasn't talking about it. So these things just don't make it easy. The kids didn't understand it. And we um, all, how old were your kids at this stage? They were still little ones at home. Mm, yeah, home and through high school. And you want to protect your kids, don't you? You don't want to blow up in front of them, and, and even have trying to demonstrate that self control can be exhausting in itself. It can. You you, you try to do the righty, but sometimes. You sort of say that now you need to slow down, but something will occur, something will be said, and there'll just be an explosive response, and the kids will scuttle away. Yeah. And once yeah. you think, well, that's done really well, great communications. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. But going on to the, the counselling aspect, I'd got out of the army in 2003, and I, was, I had work, I was doing all right, and... I saw this GP, in fact, he was an Indian fella, and he'd seen me a number of times for little bits and pieces, you know, as, as an ex-veteran, there's bits of your body just you know, <laughs> aching, <Breaking>. injured, you <laughs> know, need replacing. Need and, physio. <laughs> yeah. Well, in those days, mate, we didn't like to admit any injuries physically because, you know, you wanted to keep your job security. Mm. Yeah. You know? So if, if you mention that, yeah, yep. if you mention something's amiss, there's a potential that you aren't going to be employed. Yeah. And then yeah. the Army went through a period where they changed how they looked at fitness for deployment. Mm-hmm. And if you couldn't deploy, you couldn't be employed. Right. So, so the last thing you want to do is... Admit that you've got a problem. Yes. And, yeah. you know, mental health. Yeah. Goodness gracious, that, that didn't exist. We didn't have any problems anywhere across the Army. Oh, and of course no. you didn't. <laughs> so, and no. we certainly didn't discuss it. Um, wow. But this doctor that I had, this, this chap of Indian descent, was fantastic. After seeing me a number of times, he said to me, Gary, do you want to talk about... Barry. Do you want to talk about mental health? And I said, No. <laughs> So he said, okay, and we sort of looked at the bits and pieces and needed to be looked at. And the next time he came in and said, after our last discussion on mental health, I've decided to print off a few bits of paper oh, for you. Oh, what a wonderful doctor, Harry. <laughs> he, he was amazing. onto it. He understood you. He said, yeah. you might want to have a read of these. Mm. Good on him. I thought, no, I'll take them he away. He was planting that seed. Oh, he, he was good. He was very, very good. Sounds like he was patient too. Yeah. And same as the other, the next time after that I went back and he said, you know, once again, you know, are, are we ready to talk about this? Mm. So we sort of, I said, oh, well, maybe next time. Ah. So, this was a drip feed? Yeah. No, he, he did very well. He, he persisted. In the end he said, yeah, listen, you know, if you don't want to talk to me, and I felt quite comfortable talking to him, but I hadn't talked to anyone about mental health. Yeah. And... And I still wasn't sure it was mental health. I just wasn't doing things well. 
there was a, a local councillor and he sent me down there and the councillor listened to me for about an hour and he said, mate, you've got a lot of problems <laughs> yeah. and I probably can't help you. Okay, and that must have made you feel good. Oh, yeah. He said, <laughs> you should go to DVA and get assistance. Department of Veterans Affairs. Yeah, and I thought, oh, I don't know. So it's about this period that I had that nightmare and had kicked the wife and punched her in the back. And I thought, well, I've got to do something. So I fill out a claim and I'm trying to work out what I'm claiming for because in those days you couldn't get any assistance until you had a recognised diagnosis and the diagnosis right. must have been attributable to your service. Yeah, and it has to be written, it has to be done by a psychiatrist yes. as well, doesn't it? Yep. Yeah. Now Can I now. just ask as well, were you drinking a lot of alcohol at that time? Far too much. Yeah, because so many, um, like, ex-servicemen yeah. drink yeah. alcohol. Yeah, too. alcohol's a great tool so you can actually get to sleep. Mm. You, know, you come to the stage where you're sick and tired of waking up sick and tired, mm. but yeah. sometimes yeah. just to be able to get into bed and shut your eyes and pass out makes it better than struggling and fighting with it of a night. Just out of curiosity, I know that with the Vietnam vets, they were often given alcohol as rations. Was that the same when you were in Rwanda? Were you given alcohol as No, a... we had no access to alcohol for the first uh, six weeks or two months. Mm -hmm. And then it was quite limited, the amount of opportunity. Okay. Yeah. Um, but while we were there, people got the opportunity to go to Nairobi a couple of times during the visit. Mm -hmm. And there was a a leave period where people could take, I think, a week or 10 days leave. They could either go home or go and have a look at something in Africa, seeing they were there. Mm -hmm. But you weren't getting, like, alcohol every day there, no, so that wasn't ingrained. Sorry, not. anyway, go yeah. back and to that, your counsellor. Well, yeah, the, the, the alcohol, you know, wasn't a general problem over there anyway. No. And when you came home and you emerged with these PTSD symptoms about 10 years later, 10, 15 years later, did the, did the drinking come on slowly, your own habits at home? Or? No, well, a lot of the sleep stuff... I think I probably brought that back with me. Right, yeah. Um, so you started so drinking then to go to sleep. drinking and you know, normal servicemen have a lot of access to alcohol, mm. you know, while you're in the country. Yeah. Um, and I probably took far too great an advantage over that. Right. So alcohol was a problem going from, you know, 1995 when I get back, probably all the way forward. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry, we interrupted you at the... So you were attend, You needed to fill out this form. Yep, so fill out the form and I thought, well, okay, the first bit of admission to myself, it's got to be a mental health concern I've got. Mm -hmm. And I had to look at what's available and there's only three choices, PTSD, well, that's not me because I have no empathy, I had no concerns <laughs> about what I saw. Depression, well, I'm not depressed. Anxiety, I've heard of it, that must be it. Right, yep. I'll put it down and send it in. <laughs> yep. So DBA contacted me back and they said, oh, you know, you'll need to go and see your psychiatrist and get a report. I said, well, I don't have a psychiatrist. I will get your psychologist to point one out for you. I, was, I don't have a psychologist <laughs> either. Mm. They were just expecting you that you'd already had all that yeah. set up. Okay. Yeah. So after searching the yellow pages... <laughs> yellow pages, let your fingers do the walking. Yeah, <laughs> did a bit of ringing around... And there were a couple that sort of knocked me back straight away because the DVA reporting process was quite challenging. Mm, it's uh, arduous. Yep, yeah, and DVA weren't overly good payers for the amount of time that it would take them in their professional role to do it. Mm -hmm. But I found one and uh, went in and saw this lady and she was very good. She just sort of started me talking and I babbled on for a bit over an hour and she said, I can't imagine you doing that. So I've probably got a good enough feel of what's going on in your mind. Yeah. He's and, a babbler. Uh, yeah, I, I, I do get away. When I feel comfortable, it's yeah. great. I can talk all the time. Yes. Mm. Um, yep. <laughs> and it went really well until the end because I didn't understand what anxiety was and I certainly didn't think I fitted the profile for, you know, depression or PTSD. And I sort of said to her, you know, well, is it anxiety? And at that stage, she said to me, I'm preparing a report for the Department of Veteran Affairs. What's in the report is between them and me. And I thought, oh. oh, well, this has gone well. <laughs> she got all snooty with you. I got home and spoke to the wife and I said, I'm not sure I did well. Oh, you poor uh, thing. You and, uh, divulged your heart. And, I said, yeah, no, we'll just have to see how it goes. judgment again. Yeah. yeah. About a week later, I march up to the mailbox and get a letter and there's one from the Department of Veteran Affairs. I'm like, beauty. 
Like you start getting something done. Get some help. And the letter said, uh, Dear Perry, on based on the report of the clinical psychiatrist, on an interview you had on such and such a day, your claim for uh, anxiety has been rejected. Gee. And I thought, ah, beauty. So I went down and spoke to the wife and said, I don't know what's going on. I'm not obviously not crazy. I don't know what's the matter with me. So I don't know where we go. Did you, at this stage, just think, I'm just an asshole. I haven't really got no, anything No, I knew I was an asshole. <laughs> <laughs> just teasing. Much earlier than that with my behaviour. <laughs> just but teasing. I just thought I had only one route open to me. Yeah. And mm, now closed it's closed. It. Yeah. Right. So I thought, well, that's hopeless. Do you remember feeling helpless? Absolutely. Yeah. And, you know, it's probably the closest we've been to suicidal at that right. stage. Oh, that's awful. And about a week later, I go to the mailbox and I've got two letters from DVA. Oh. So I open up the first one. It says, Dear Perry, based on the um, clinical psychiatric report provided by Dr. So and so on such and such a date, we've identified that um, PTSD is present and we're going to accept that. Oh. And the second one I open up was reading exactly the same but saying it accepts depression. Oh. So you had two letters saying we accept you, but the first one said we reject you, yep. well, and just... you didn't you didn't know the next two were coming. So no, that, that was no, a very it, vulnerable week oh, for you. Incredibly vulnerable. See, wouldn't you have thought they would have put all three in one letter? Yep. You tick these boxes, but not yeah. this one. Yeah. So I went back down to the, the house and I said, "Well, I don't know. I think I think it's bullshit because mm. I don't think I have these two. Right. You know, once again, it was, you know, Professor. <laughs> <laughs> Professor Parry <Yeah. laughs> diagnoses himself. Does his own stuff. <laughs> He's this come, was before Google. Yeah. yeah. He's come back you. with a misdiagnosis, but I'll mm. accept the misdiagnosis yeah. because it'll allow me to get some help. Mm. <laughs> so, accept the misdiagnosis, okay. Which was actually the correct diagnosis. Yeah. 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 So I then went and saw my GP, and she was a lovely lady. I changed GPs because we just moved um, down to Perth at that stage, and I'd known her in the past. So we started medication. Mm-hmm. Um, and sort of bumped me onto um, SSRIs. So they did really good stuff with my head. Yeah. So in as much as I was starting to sleep much better, I'd still have you know, many nights where I don't sleep well, but I was sleeping much better than what I was. Um, my crankiness came down. Mm -hmm. um, the frequency of my crankiness also down. came down. Yeah. So that was all a big positive. After I'd been on those for a few months, I thought they weren't as effective as what they were when we started. Mm -hmm. So we just went to a bigger dose. Did you have any side effects? Oh, many side effects. Mm, what were they? Um, the majority of side effects were really about sexual performance. Yeah, that's um, the most common problem. Yeah. So it would start with, I wouldn't call it erectile dysfunction, but the ability to get um, Keep going. Yeah. a regular decent erection was challenging. Um, but the biggest side effect from it was the ability to actually... Have an orgasm. Yeah. Uh. And it would be at the stage where things are going well, great time in bed, the wife's just done her bit, it's ready for me to do my bit, I'm probably about 10 strokes off. <laughs> so 10 strokes off becomes 20 strokes off. <laughs> Another 20 should fix it. And the big problem here is that you're not so cranky anymore, so your wife actually wants to have sex yeah, with you and yeah. then you can't perform. Yeah. And yeah. So I got frustrated about that, mm. but I was sort of more happy with the fact that we're actually having sexual intimacy again rather than just being cranky all the time and getting nothing. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So I tolerated that medication for sort of a couple of years and then I said, oh, we've got to do something better than this. Mm -hmm. So then I dropped to a lower dose and that didn't really do enough for my head. Yeah. So then we changed brands and it was supposed to be a better result with that brand, but it really didn't do much more. Then I decided I probably don't need that. So mm. I discussed with the GP and I went off them all together. And she knew there was dangers in that. And did you just go cold turkey? Uh, we thinned out, but I thinned out a bit quicker. Right, yeah, because that's um, pretty... Yeah, but we discussed it and I knew, yeah. what, knew what was going on. Okay, and yeah. Well, I was having sort of regular contact with the GP. Did yeah. you become cranky again? Came cranky again and I said, well, this is no good. But I sort of accepted that I'll take the medication now 
and we'll see how we go. Mm -hmm. um, so I continued with medication that sort of worked for my head and accepted for years the effect the fact the effect it has on sexual performance. Yeah. And I was very, very fortunate. The wife was sort of undemanding and mm -hmm. didn't complain or didn't mock me. Mm. So, she probably thought it was great that it took you 20 strokes or more. Oh, I just get just, just 20 became 40, 80, <laughs> 100, 120. Stroke it to the left. <laughs> and, that was and, our 80s song. And you'd sort of you'd come to the stage and you I just give up too hard. <laughs> too difficult. Mm. It was just mm. too challenging. Yeah. Um, mm. So sort of, they were the, the main challenge with the medications. Once I saw a psychiatrist, um, he gave me some different medication. Once again, an SSRI, very, very similar chemical to what I'd been using in the past, mm -hmm. but it had slightly better effects. Great. So it still doesn't fix things, mm. but it sort of did all the good stuff that I needed doing for my head. Yeah. Um, but wasn't as um, effective on sort of sexual performance. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you manage with what you got. Yeah. And I'm just sort of, you know, grateful that I've got that. So you're still taking that medicine now? Yep, still taking yeah. it today. And so that's really helped you, obviously, with your brain. Yeah. Yeah. And, and are you getting regular counselling still? No. I, I, um, after the stage, I'd been on medication a few years and it wasn't particularly working. Yeah. So that was... Um, six years right. on meds yeah. without anything else, I decided I've really got to do something and get some more help with it mm. because i have been stretching the relationship probably as far as it was going to go. Mm -hmm. You know, I had a, um, a lot of bad habits. Like, I didn't want to go out. Mm. Um, I'm just reading some of the words that you put together in preparation for night and if you don't mind i'm just going to yeah. say a few of them because they're pretty privity um pivotal and and heartfelt your your emotional cup seemed to always be just sort of overflowing um you'd lost interest in things that i once enjoyed doing including including going out with family and friends you were no longer able to smell the roses and had a lack of interest in things you were not able to see the sunny side of a situation Things like fishing and diving and sport and watching and or participating or watching and reading, uh, extreme anxiety in groups of people and you went to efforts, great efforts to avoid these situations and you sought to be by yourself a lot. You mentioned the other day that you used to go prospecting. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that, how, how that featured for you. Well, it was one of the good opportunities where without having to make excuses I could just be out in the bush by myself. Mm. So I'd detect for gold by day and by night and drink a fair bit of grog and talk to my dog. But mm. it wasn't like most people call camping. It was fairly survivalistic in as much as I'd just throw a swag on the ground. If it was gonna rain, I just tolerated the rain. Mm. Um, it sounds like you were t sort of torturing yourself a bit. Yeah, I don't know, I was torturing it, but I could never get my head clear while I was out there. I thought I'd go out bush to clear my head, but then I'd be wondering if, you know, how the wife and the girls were and it was once again, you know, worrying about things that I have no control over whatsoever. Mm. Um, and, and fearful of not being able to work and support my family and of fearful of people finding out what was going on with you. These are all words that you said. Your inability to effectively communicate your feelings and just your inability to concentrate. And, and obviously the role that touches me in those words, Perry, is that sense of responsibility to your family as a man and, and the... The bearing of that on your shoulders, yeah. can you just lighten on that a little oh, bit? Oh, okay. the, the fear I had is always not being able to support my family. Mm. Um, the provider, the protector. Yeah. And if you, if you can't work, you can't provide. Mm. So it was easy for me to hide how I felt at work, the same as what I did it when I was in the army. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you can put on a brave front for short periods of time. And I was lucky. I had a job that allowed me to be by myself mm. a lot of the time. What did you do, Perry? Um, I used to inspect rail infrastructure. Mm -hmm. So I could just go away and inspect things, basically put together my own program as to how it was done. Um, most of the time they'd know where I was simply from radio calls checking yeah. in. Mm -hmm. But you know, I had 
four years in that role before I even saw a supervisor in the field. Really? Yeah. Mm. And yeah, never saw. So that's a perfect job for someone. It was someone, someone you, you can hide and escape. Mm. I know. Sorry, I'm really curious about if other people were noticing anything or, you know, mates, you know, did anyone bring you aside? We have the Are You OK campaign these days. Did anyone kind of occasionally just touch you on the no. shoulder and say, Parry, are you OK, mate? No, never at all. And what do you think that is? I think I just had a brave front on. Right. Yeah. I know um, my father was a Vietnam vet and I know that he said that he had all of these things really, you know, ring true with me, this anxiety in groups of people. He couldn't, he drank a lot as well and yeah. couldn't go out in groups of people and he drank a lot. But the thing he always said was that he wished he was a lighthouse keeper. Yeah. Because wow. all yeah. he ever wanted to do was just be on his own. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was very much like that. But... Even when you work by yourself and you're socialised by yourself, it can still be extremely lonely. Yeah. So even though I say you don't want any social contact, it, you, you know that it's lonely. And you know you're missing mm. out. Yeah. yeah. And you're missing your wife and yeah. your girls. And the connection with people. Mm. and the support I, I would get particularly everybody. wound up you know, if I was going over to a friend's place and you know, we'd still do that on occasions. There are some people that I could feel quite comfortable with. Mm. But if there was an extra stranger there I didn't know or someone that didn't feel in that same degree, I would make excuses when we got there and I found these extra people. Yeah. You know, I'd tell my wife I'm feeling crook and right. make, make excuses to go home. Yeah. Mm. Um, so... So I think you were right. I think you do have some anxiety. Oh, yeah, I think the, the, you nailed it. To the yeah, social yeah, anxiety. Yeah. 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 There, were, there were probably a few concerns in there that mm. needed addressing. But yeah. people weren't really opening up or noticing, you know. No. No. Mm. Or they, would, they might have said things behind behind your... my back, but nothing was sort of said to me. And what about your wife? Was she trying to explore this with you or was she just sort of in survival mode herself, do you think? No, she was in survival mode until the, the nightmare issue and my going to a psychologist... Um, her most common response will be, what have I done to make you cranky? No, oh, mm. yeah. So she was and, blaming herself. Yeah, so I would rouse at her that, you know, it's got nothing to do with her. Mm. She's not the problem. Yeah. And I'm just sort of get out of my face. And she and probably sometimes, say, but what is the problem? Yeah, what is the problem? Sometimes I was particularly rude. There yeah. was no doubt about it. I was particularly rude. Mm. Um, and what about your daughters? How did they cope through all of this? They just sort of, I won't say they hid from me, but it, it was close. Mm -hmm. And another painful aspect before um, I'd started the counselling was, I think at that stage, the youngest daughter had moved out of home. Mm -hmm. And the wife had told me quite plainly that the girls would much rather not be anywhere around me. Wow. Mm -hmm. So, That's so you know, that cuts sort of straight to the bone. Mm -hmm. You know, the thing that you live for yeah. doesn't want to know you. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. And that was another catalyst to, to go to counselling. Mm -hmm. I remember when I first started, and I got a very good counsellor through um, VVCS, or they're now referred to as Open Arms, so that they look after, you know, serving and ex-serving veterans and their families. Great. Um, so I was speaking to this psychologist, and she said, you know, what do you want to get out of this? And I said, I probably need to be able to explain the issues to my wife. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that... that took a lot of effort, mm -hmm. but once we decided that that's the path we're going to go down, that's what we sort of worked on. Yeah. And we worked through sort of so many different pieces, you know, with her. So I continued the counselling oh, six odd years, I think. So I had a fairly good understanding of PTSD by that stage. Was your wife attending these counselling sessions or no, just you? But I was fortunate they had a, um, early on in the piece, they had a, a relationship it was nearly a week away where mm -hmm. they took a number of couples away. I think there was five couples. Mm. And they explained all the issues with serving in the Defence Force wow. to the to the wives. Wow. So there was sort of, sometimes it was all together. Wait, do you remember when this was? Like, is it more a re more recent thing? Because it's no, quite no, a no, step no. This, up. No, this was um, still under the VVCS banner, so that was... Must have been um, back 2015. 2015. Yeah. But not that, that's pretty recent, just five years. Yeah. What an amazing yeah. so thing. It, it was great. They were overview stuff, mm -hmm. then that sort of split up. You know, in our group, we had no female veterans. Um, so, you know, the women would go one way and they had a number of psychologists there and a number of other players to help out. And 
you know men would discuss business looking at things as a veteran and the wives would discuss the challenges they've had being married to a soldier, a sailor or an airman. Mm. Um, so that was the first really, really positive thing to come. Well, that's fantastic. And from that, Patsy, even though she'd been married to me for years, got to understand, you know, some of the things she might not have picked up What a up relief on. for her. She must have felt, yeah. I'm not alone either. Yep. You know, the company of those other women. Yep. Uh, what's that beautiful film? The... And they're all making the quilt together. Oh, I love that film. Mm. Yeah, but they, they, they were just kind of weaving their stories over a weekend yeah. um, mm. and realised that they were all sharing the same story, just different, you know, volumes of intensity. So did that change your relationship with Most her? certainly. Yeah, Most great. certainly. There were yeah. a number of concerns that my wife had that I thought they were trivia, mm -hmm. but they were significant to her. Mm. So it took a change in sort of mindset for me to say, well, if it's significant to her, it's significant. Yeah. It doesn't if matter it how her, I perceive it. Bothers it bothers me. It yeah. should bother you. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we sorted that out and we sorted other bits and pieces out and there was some yoga done and... Um, oh, good. So <laughs> it, it was a really good week. Yeah. At times incredibly intense. Mm hmm You know, sort of had all people in tears at different stages of it, mm -hmm. but... But yeah. you were processing things and oh, yeah. lots of things that were, were, were pent up were probably being, you know, released and, and you had the opportunity to express yourself freely in a way that you probably had felt, you know, hindered from or you wanted to protect people. We're not saying the truths, but in, in a guided way and supported way, it sounds like it was a really, really wonderful environment for you oh, to Oh, it was. The, the, the location was great. Mm. These psychologists were fantastic. The other couples were all good people. I wonder if they run those things now. Yeah, they do. They do. They yeah. sound amazing. Yeah. So, because we're getting on with time, but what uh, uh, now? Where do you feel like you're at now? Like, oh, I'm managed. Yeah. You know, um, I s still have the same GP. She is great. I yeah. check in with her, you know, quite regularly. Mm -hmm. And mental health is always one of the things we discuss how I'm rolling. Your Indian doctor will be so proud of yeah, you. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, have you told him? You should write to him. He'd probably I'd love to, this I'd story. have to track him down. He was a great person. I think he'd be. I think he'd love to have a chat with yeah, you. I think Harry. you should track him down and send him this and podcast. I think we will. I think we yeah. will. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, we will. How's yeah, that for yeah, a deal? Yeah. 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 Um, I've got some of my other health practitioners now, like the. Through DVA, I get to go to um, an exercise physiologist exercise. a number of times a week. Mm -hmm. um, she knows all about my mental health. My normal physio that looks after my back, mm -hmm. I've had her for quite some time. She knows all about my mental health. Mm -hmm. So we have many sessions of discussing team. You know, yep. whether I've been a good boy or a bad boy. Whether <laughs> sort of, um, you need to put the bucks and gloves for a few more minutes this week. Yeah. Does yeah. exercise? Does the exercise help with your mood? Of course it does. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and. One of the troubles I faced is that I did. I was too. I'm still too lazy to exercise. <laughs> but if I have an that's appoint, my secret too. Yep, if yep. I have an appointment, I attend. Yeah, yeah. that's motivating. Yeah, there are a number of other things. Um, just giving once again DVA a bit of a plug here because they've changed over the years. Yeah. Um, they nowadays, have. with mental health, you just say you need help and they give you help. There's no need for a diagnosis. Mm, no just, need for those papers that reject you yeah, and then accept yeah, you in a yeah. week. Great but in between. I'm just going to give DVA a down plug right now. They still don't accept nurse practitioners oh, as agree. providers. But that's they, the only bad. Other yeah. than that, I think they're way yeah, amazing. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're doing some great stuff. Um, but the exercise makes all the difference in the world. I can. I still have days where I'm cranky. Mm -hmm. But if when I start exercising, and yeah, it's, the character of Max is as well as the exercise itself. But I generally come out of that session feeling good, feeling happy, and. There is a, a very, very distinct line between mental well-being and physical well-being. Yeah, definitely. absolutely. Yeah. And I, I have that um, PROS charity that I set up in 2012 for men who are going through prostate cancer. And I've always said our triple aims are to improve the mood, muscle and mateship of men while they go through prostate cancer. So everybody who's there is in a similar situation. Yeah. So you understand each other. It's a safe place immediately when you walk in. You know, in your case, everyone's been through some, you know, um, PTSD yeah. and they've got this background of being in the armed services. So it's it's a place where you probably feel already that you belong, like a club of your own. Yeah. Is that sort of yeah, something I still you could comment on? I spend a lot of time by myself. 
Mm-hmm. But in the exercise group or? No, in life yeah. in general. Oh, sorry, like, no, I mean in the exercise group. Oh, the exercise that... group yeah, are yeah. always good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So your daughters, has your relationship since you've done all this personal work improved with yes. them? Yes, yeah, most yeah. certainly. Yeah, so that's um, good. They, they still sort of, I will ring them a couple of times a week or weekly depending on what's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, they ring me as well. Great. So I'm a bit of a sounding board for them, you know, mm-hmm. after a hard day's work or when something's challenging them. Yeah. So most of my bridges have been repaired. Mm-hmm. Um, the big takeaway that I give for anyone that's listening to this and think, ooh, I might have some of those characteristics, is that you need to first of all accept that you need some help. Don't try and put a label on it. Don't say that you're, you're crazy or you've got a... Got you're a, just a human. Yeah, a mental health issue. Yeah. You, know, you just need somebody to have a listen and give you... A bit of help. Yeah, and a part bit of space of, to think sometimes. Yeah, part of what they'll do, head. they'll yeah. label you. Yeah. Mm. yeah. That's why we have professionals. But don't worry about the label because all the label means, as you've seen, is gets your help. Yeah, and I don't care now. Mm. You know, I will talk to people and admit that I've had mental health challenges mm. and that I got help for it now and I didn't do it all easy. Mm. And some of it was hard and some of it was extremely challenging for my family and extremely challenging for myself. And I love what you've written here in our notes as well. I want to quote you directly. Understand that others cannot see into your head unless you talk. They will not know what you're feeling. Loved ones will be confused by your behaviour. If you don't learn to communicate with them, you may lose them. Yep. PTSD can be managed, and you've underlined that. Yeah, I think it's a great story, and I think there's so much, like, Um, stigma attached to mental health and I just think if we can get rid of that stigma and go and seek help you're the perfect example of how that can turn your life around. Have you been suicidal again from that since that time or as things... No I think that's probably the closest I've ever been. I'm probably too selfish (laughs) not... (laughs) Sorry I laughed but I didn't expect that answer. I've never been fearful of death Mm. but I've still got obligations that I need to complete right. with regard to Good. looking after my family. Purpose. We have yeah. purpose in your yeah. day. Mm. So sometimes I think it's easier to just cut away and I can certainly understand why suicide happens. Mm. Yeah. But you know, my aim was to get myself sorted out. Um, like I'm now out of the workforce. I'm a much happier person for that. A lot of the triggers that I was still experiencing came from working, so the, the stresses and the anxiety... Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I had a great job, yeah. no doubt about it. But I would start worrying about what I've got to do next week when I was flying home for my six days. Yeah. Can I ask one question? Because this is something that is really why we're here. Mates to mates, bloke to bloke. Are you comfortable talking to male friends? Oh, this? now, now I am. You, do you tap men on the shoulder now? Do you? Yes, do you yeah. have that "Are you okay?" question? And yeah. has that changed? I, I have people that I ride motorbikes with, I people that I go out prospecting with now, whereas yep. before I used to do it by myself. Wow. Yep. I regularly talk about mental health. Mm. Um, I talk about the challenges I had dealing with prostate cancer. Yeah, um, and we haven't even mentioned yeah. that. Yeah. I talk about you know the, the challenges with um, getting your head right and medications. Yeah, yeah. Early in the piece, some of them had eyes like saucers, mm. thinking, you know, what have we got here? Mm. But, you know, to see you, Parry, you're this big, strong, jovial guy. With an awesome beard, I have yeah. to say. And so, you know, people, <laughs> other men are going to look at you and the, the fact, the power in you being able to say, I've been down and I've had these problems and look at me now, that's just amazing. I would, you know, going back 10 years wouldn't have discussed it at all. Yeah. You know, is there anything wrong with you? No, I am fine, thank you. Mm. So what's your takeaway message that you would give to any men? If you've got a concern with how you're thinking, how your behaviour is around your loved ones, go and get some assistance. Yeah. You, know, you can't do it by yourself. You can't ignore it. It won't go away. Mm. But if you get the right help, it can be managed. And if anything else, it's like all wounds, it festers if you don't get oh, help. It can spiral out of control yeah and you know that's one of the troubles i face nowadays with you know every time you read the paper we've got another young soldier sailor or airman that's taken their own life it's tragic um some you know sometimes the wife and the mums will see that there's a concern there but it's sometimes it's very very hard to go from you know being a strong capable military veteran 
to someone that admits they've got problems, particularly to those that they want the respect from, you know, like you know, family and mm. you know, immediate family and friends. And we know that we know that sadly, eighty percent of all suicides are committed by men. We know that one man per minute globally takes his own life. That's eight men per day um, across Australia. Um, it's double the statistics of motor vehicle accidents with the highest age group between 18 and um, 35 and then a even higher age group in the over 80s. So it's a topic that really needs to be open. And, um, yeah, from my own perspective, I think that's possibly why I even want to start the podcast series, to be perfectly honest, to, to make the quality of life for, for men better by men sharing their own stories. So, And I think there's something to be said in that it's actually a strength to share your feelings rather than a, a weakness. strength to show vulnerability. Yeah. yeah, and I think that shows, you know, how mature and strong you are that you can share your feelings yeah. and that's what we need to encourage younger men to do. And I, I like to think that younger men are getting better at that. And we've just had um, the gorgeous young prince that we've um, interviewed earlier today and he's come in with his mum and discussed a, a penis problem. And, you know, when he came in and attended the physiotherapy rooms with his mum one day to discuss something called Peroni's disease, I was blown away that this could even be possible, that, you know, we'd have this um, really, you know, healthy conversation between a mum and his son and resolution in just about six weeks of a, of a really, you know, potentially big problem. So times are a-changing and in yoga we talk about not being stuck to try and just even use your breath to keep flowing through and know that as you breathe in you can breathe out and while the heart is ticking there's always hope just one footstep at a time sometimes so we just would love to say thank you so much for sharing your story it was great and um yeah you know, it's an amazing story and I bet your family's really glad that you've worked through and it. And so proud of you. And you should be so, so proud of yourself because, mm. uh, you know, not easy, as you said, though, were your yeah. first words. Yeah. No, you're doing great work, ladies. Thank Is you. there anything else you'd like to add before we go? No, all good. No, all good? Thank you. Thanks, heaps. Thanks, Harry. Harry. I'm going to tell you about a boy who lives inside me. Dr Joe here. Thanks so much for listening and don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. We aim to release one podcast per fortnight so please keep in touch so you know when new podcasts are being released. Also be sure to check out the show notes below so that we can all keep the conversation going. Of warm afternoons Campfires and birds Smoking bark in a cubby up a tree Try to ignore fate.